Greetings. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about protecting the bounty of our ocean beyond national boundaries, why geography matters for creating an ocean we want in 2050. That's as a science fiction fanatic and a scuba diver, I've often wondered what our ocean will look like in 2050. We have a range of trajectories that have been developed by colleagues out of the Stockholm Resilience Center. One, which is rising CO2 emissions, increasing fish catches, illegal and illegal, um, that create an ocean where the last fish is basically gone. We're getting there already. We have over 500 dead zones in our coastal waters where ocean life can no longer thrive as we know it, besides microbes and jellyfish. We're increasing or decreasing the level of oxygen in many of our open ocean waters beyond national boundaries caused by accelerating levels, levels of CO2 emissions. These are creating low oxygen zones that challenge the livelihoods of all creatures that are living out in the open ocean. Where we may end up if we continue on this trajectory is an ocean where only extractive industries like oil and gas, seabed mining may thrive, and perhaps we're pushed to consuming jellyfish because that is also the only type of living creature that can thrive in a low oxygen and polluted ocean. Did you have a jellyfish burger for lunch today? Well, uh, yes, um, the trajectory is not all gloom, grim, thus we do have a chance to bend the curve. Thus one of the trajectories also shows that we can learn to live in harmony with nature by creating equipment and technologies that are there to solve our problems of plastic pollution, of fishing gear caught in coral reefs that help to maintain and restore our coastal areas as well as oceans beyond. So what will the future be? The future is really in our hands. And today, of course, I'm glad to say I'm somewhat more optimistic than I was when I began this presentation. That's because we don't really have a choice to act like island, one island nation. That was because the ocean is interconnected by its very physical nature of currents and eddies. We're also connected to the ocean by the creatures we share the planet with, who may lay their eggs in the shores of Florida, but swim up north through the Gulf Stream into the Sargasso Sea and across to the Azores and down through the Canary Islands and back to the Florida Keys. This endless migratory voyage may be stopped short by pollution, by plastic, by nets in the ocean. So it is up to us to act as stewards of our vast ocean planet. Connect connectivity also means that international cooperation is essential if we are going to make progress. And this is no place more true than in areas beyond national jurisdiction. This is divide the ocean is divided into multiple zones, if you will, that you've probably been hearing mainly about areas within national jurisdiction, the exclusive economic zones out to 200 nautical miles and the 12 mile territorial sea. Well, I spend most of my time dwelling in the ocean beyond 200 nautical miles, the so-called high seas, where the traditional notion of freedom of the seas has meant that activities can begin without really effective scrutiny of their environmental impact until they start to cause problems. This in a changing and uncertain and climate stressed ocean may no longer be suitable. In the deep seabed area, we have a different regime that was established in 1982 under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, where nations around the world agreed that it was time to share the wealth of the ocean, to look towards an international machinery that was going to both manage on behalf of humankind and ensure that there were no significant adverse effects caused by deep seabed mining. They believed in the 1970s and 1980 that these seabed minerals were going to be a new found source of wealth to lift prosperity for all across the planet. But unfortunately, we have learned that there is going to be a significant challenge in ensuring the sustainability of this new industry called deep seabed mining, especially if we actually want to uphold our primary obligation under the Law of the Sea Convention, which is to protect and preserve the marine environment. And this applies both within and beyond national jurisdiction. However, because of the way the ocean is 
allocated into zones of yours, mine, and ours, we have differing ranges of responsibilities and options for ensuring better management. As you can see, many of the impacts on this map that are orange and yellow show medium and high, but 41% of our ocean just in 2008 was already shown to be highly strongly affected. And what concerns me and should concern all of us is that we now have the capacity to map the interaction of these impacts and put climate change on top of this, which we now know is rapidly affecting the poles faster than any other place on the planet. So those blue areas that may have existed in 2008 are no longer there. The green areas that existed in 2008 are no longer there because of increasing deoxygenation. We do have problems that need to be addressed rapidly because it's not just rising CO2, but it's the ocean warming that goes with it. It is the acidification that goes along with it and the deoxygenation and the combination of the three that are creating an ocean of uncertainty, an ocean of surprises and an ocean generally of limits. And we're not really good at recognizing these limits as we go forward into our planning. And this is going to require a new way of thinking about ocean management and ocean governance. We're used to being able to go to the sea for bound endless supplies of seafood. We're now more and more going to the sea for foods and nutraceuticals. We're going after the smallest critters in the ocean that happen to be food also for the rest of the fish and the other critters that we like to share our planet with. We're going to the ocean more and more for hydrocarbons, for minerals, but these industries are very difficult to control uh, their environmental impact of. We have to learn to share our material, we have to learn to share our space, but we can only do it if everybody and everything is pulling their own weight. Because the scientists are telling us more and more is the only thing we can really be sure about is future surprises. Thus, we're living in a world of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, which makes huge challenges for ocean management and governance for decision making. Who do you know you're actually going to be affecting? Who are you benefiting? Who will lose? But the guiding principle in a world of uncertainty is also precaution. So how do we integrate precaution into a world that's too used to looking at their cell phones for information, but forgets the world of nature that is around it? We've heard from experts dealing with biodiversity that if we are going to bend the curve, bend the trajectory of ocean decline, of biodiversity decline around our planet, we truly do need to start thinking about transformative changes across economic, social, political, and technological frontiers. And I'm here today to talk about how we can tr transform ocean governance across political frontiers into areas beyond national jurisdiction. And that's because the current framework that we have established for governing and managing our ocean bounty, our ocean plenty in areas beyond national jurisdiction is based on concepts from 1950s, 1960s, when pollution had not really been seen as such a problem, when climate change was not even really considered to be a part. So now in the context of a changing ocean, we really need to consider do we allocate all responsibility for managing fisheries and the environment that these fish swim in just to regional fisheries management organizations? Or do they need to be helped by a solid stream of science, including geography, to better understand the context and place of fish and other species in the ocean in which they are swimming? International shipping, how is that going to be affected by climate change? Are they going to be impacted by more extreme waves, currents, storms? We need better information. We need better geographic information systems. And international seabed is in the hands of the International Seabed Authority, but only a small number of states actually participate. Do we live decis leave decisions that are going to be determining the fate of our shared ocean in the hands of just a few states, driven largely by economic interests? Well, 
we do have other institutions such as the United Nations that are more representative of the global population of the 193 states that are part of sovereign states, but they also allow observers to participate, including um, indigenous peoples, including people from around the world. We have a much more equitable and accessible institution in New York that is there, it's fit for purpose to better assess and address some of these rising challenges in our global ocean. And for that reason, some many of us have been looking at the United Nations and forging a new agreement for marine biodiversity, conservation and sustainable use in areas beyond national jurisdiction, something we fondly call the BB&J agreement. I've been involved in these negotiations or discussions since 2003, um, but negotiations started in earnest in 2008. They were supposed to be finished by the end of this year, but unfortunately, just as the planet has been totally disrupted by COVID-19, the negotiations are also in suspension. But we're hoping that the negotiations will resume, resume as soon as possible in 2021. But if we want the negotiations to truly create a platform for cooperation into the future to achieve the ocean we want for the future we all want, we really hope to set step up the ambition, to step up to a new view, vision of the ocean as one that we all share as a planet the unitary ocean, the one ocean whose welfare depends on all of our contributions, all of our responsibilities, and all of our support. So how do we get there from here? That's, well, fortunately, we have many tools at our disposal right now. That's, we have increased amount of scientific information that help us tag and track where these sea turtles go. We have information that tells us where fishing vessels go. We have information from space, from in the sea, from deep on the sea floor. So how do we bring this together to better inform ocean governance and management? Well, in many ways, the BB&J agreement can really help. That was uh, just like the octopus. We have eight roles that I will identify here today, but the octopus is not just a system of independent tentacles. It is a unified whole that can move both independently as well as together and is in constant communication back to the central hub. That's first of all, we can align our priorities towards ocean health, towards ocean resilience and ocean productivity based on commonly accepted principles of precaution and ecosystem-based management, respect for nature, as well as um, science-based management. We can establish marine protected areas to protect and restore vulnerable and important and representative areas of the marine environment, protecting the full range of biodiversity. But we can't just protect small islands in the sea. Many are saying we need at least 30% protected for nature in order to capture the full range of biodiversity. But even that, I would suggest, is not enough. I'm not greedy, but I am also saying we need to be managing for 100% ecological sustainability. We can no longer afford to just fish until the fish are gone and then switch to another fish stock. We need to be able to think about the consequences of our action. And that's why I'm really excited about another component of the treaty, which would provide for environmental impact assessments and strategic environmental assessments. These impact assessments can help us to anticipate and avoid harmful cumulative effects. So we better understand what the impact would be of a potential new activity, ocean fertilization to try to sequester some of the carbon dioxide is in, by many scientists said could actually exacerbate some of the problems. We need to understand the where of the why and the when, how things are going to be changing and understand that they can often cause unwelcome surprises. We need to divert harmful subsidies that are fueling the overfishing and the um, oil and gas industry. We can divert them into productive things like marine protected area management as an improved um, marine protected areas into research, into improved management. 
And we need to plan for change. We have the digits, we have the widgets, we have the information and the apps. We can protect whales off the coast of California now by observing the presence and absence of ships off the coast of Santa Barbara, the presence and absence of whales by acoustic um, sensors in the water, and we can indicate when it's wiser to slow down if we want to prevent further impacts on our impoverished whale species. Thus, we can do these things for other fish species, other stocks, sea turtles, uh, whales, and ecosystems on the move because of climate change. We do need to embed equity in everything we do. If you notice in the fine print up there, it says Tarawa, which is the current capital of the country of Kiribati that others have been talking about in this series. Is this island state really going to survive into the future? We certainly hope so. But when we're doing our scientific research, when we're creating our ocean laboratories, we also need to be thinking about how can we help the people in greatest need to have a full and prosperous life. It's not just about us, it's not just about me, it's about the we. And of course, what I'm most excited about in many ways is that we are developing the science and technology that allow us to have a full 24-7 vision of what is going on in the ocean. Uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute, uh, the United States NOAA, the European Union are, uh, have been great at setting the um, platform for international scientific cooperation. But as you un um, might understand, it's never enough. We need to start focusing on really building science capacity at a global level so that all scientists, all from around the world can have access to this information to ensure that they're able to make informed decisions to contribute to fully sustainable and equitable and ecologically um, prosperous development. So my biggest hopes for this BB&J agreement is to create an ongoing platform for cooperation. If we are to survive in this ocean of change, we do need to consider all the implications and impacts for our human actions on the ocean creatures we share this planet with. There are ways that we can also help to give nature a voice. We need to have a better window onto our ocean planet so we understand what is actually going on. Um, too often, nature is left out of our discussions when we're conducting environmental impact assessment. They look at water quality, but what is happening to the habitat of our vulnerable species? How can we actually design effective systems of marine protected areas to ensure long-term human and animal prosperity on this shared planet. And then the final component um, that I'll talk about today is of course the need to trust what our colleagues are doing, but also the ability to verify that um, technologies such as Global Fishing Watch has elaborated enable us a true eye on who is doing what where, at least when they have their automatic information system transponders on. We need to go a step further. We need to be able to see in the dark of night. We can start to use lights. We need to be able to bring together these algorithms to truly understand who the responsible fishers are, who is not, where is the transshipment going on, where is the fishing that's on the line of the Galapagos Marine Reserve or our other um, precious and vital marine protected areas. Using these technologies, we have a chance to come together, but only if we can all share in, their, in accessing these technologies and using them for management both within and beyond national jurisdiction. And I'd like to share with you in my parting moment is this wonderful video of siphonophores that were a total surprise to the scientists looking off Australia by the Ningaloo area. Um, that was just to show that not all surprises are unpleasant. We are living in a rapidly changing ocean, but who would have thought that we would find a siphonophore that's larger than two blue whales, three times as long as a humpback whale. It's as amazing to scientists that a colonial creature, just of individual component parts that all have unique roles, 
functions and aspirations, if you will, can all come together in a coherent fashion that looks perhaps like a um, UFO, but is also very much a proud part of our planet. Too often, until we've had this technology, they're just brought up as a bucket full of slime in the bottom of our fishing mate. Um, fishing nets. But if we do want to go forward to a sustainable and prosperous ocean, we need to bring together, we need to think in a circular economy, we need to think about how can we all better adapt, equip ourselves with nimble technology, with nimble decision-making processes, so we can live and survive and indeed thrive to 2050, to the 22nd century, in a world of increasing volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. We can only do that if we truly do align our priorities and principles towards ocean health and prosperity. We can only do this if we start to protect and restore nature, in marine protected areas. If we can reorient our blue economies to ensure ecological sustainability and plan for change. Yes, we need to plan for unpleasant surprises. We need to be planning for worst case scenarios, but we can also start to plan for further expeditions. How do we expand our knowledge of who is doing what, where and why, and what will the future bring? We'll only be successful if we truly do this for the benefit of all, if we enable all people to contribute, all people to benefit from the ocean, and all people to look forward to a healthy and prosperous life and ocean. For that, we need to accelerate our science and technology, and we need to create an ongoing platform for cooperation at the international level as well as at the regional levels. We have a broad array of institutions, but only if we start to align our priorities and principles and our capacities, we will be able to live in a ocean we want and the future we want. So with that, I will say thank you for listening and just show you a couple more slides to thank my collaborators in developing these images, the Schmidt Ocean Institute, Andrew Mary, uh, Stockholm Resilience Center, the XPRIZE Ocean Stories and Global Fishing Watch, and just leave you with these, um, the slide for some further information in case you would like to get in the hopes you would like to get further involved. And I'd really encourage you to learn more about all of these initiatives, including the UN Decade of Ocean Science. This is not just a UN Decade of Ocean Hard Science. This is a UN Decade of Ocean Geography, of Ocean Economics, of Ocean Health. Let's see how we can pool our resources, pool our wisdom, and truly create the ocean we need going forward. Thank you very much.